Good morning, welcome to Bagland Community Church. We are so thrilled that you could join us this morning and we're looking forward to getting in the word with you and also worshiping the incredible God that we serve. We're gonna begin the service this morning with a song called Egypt. And you know, God's deliverance of his people out of Egypt is an incredible picture of Christ's ultimate salvation and deliverance for us. Being rescued by the blood, miraculously walking through the water, the covenant with his people at Sinai, the pilgrimage through the wilderness, the crossing of the Jordan, all an incredible picture of the fact that God is our deliverer. You know, we see God being many things in the Bible. We see him being the provider, Jehovah Jireh. And we see him being a protector, but we also see him being a deliverer. And you know, that's incredible, isn't it? Because not once did he leave. Not once has he left. And so we can take comfort in that this morning, that God is a deliverer that sees us right to the, through to the end. And that means crossing over from this life to the next with him in heaven. He is with us throughout. And so if you're in a place this morning where you just don't know where you're going and you're just thinking, what on earth is going on? I feel so alone. You are not alone. God is a God of deliverance. And so this morning, cry out to him and reach out to him in your situation. Acknowledge him as the God of deliverance. He has never left, nor will he ever leave. Take comfort in that truth this morning.
we're back in the book of Philippians this week, chapter three, and the sermon title is One Thing. We'll see in a minute how focused Paul was in the way in which he lived his life. You know, I think all of us look at people who are successful in their particular field. So whether it's in the field of business and, and earning loads of money or whether it's in the sporting arena or whether it's you know, people who are, we have incredible social endeavors and enterprises and so on. You look at some of these guys um, who've made it to the top of their field, their profession, and there's always something really impressive about them. So they're obviously an intelligent, gifted, talented in so many ways, and that kind of sets them apart. But there's, there are also characteristics that they have in their lives, which we can have in ours. So you'll notice a common thread in some of these people's lives that they are completely committed to a cause they 100% believe in and are passionate about. So they have this laser focus that drives and disciplines their lives. And you see that in Paul. And so Paul and God would say to us today, we need to have that kind of focus and passion in our lives for the gospel. This is Philippians chapter 3, verse 12. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal. So Paul is saying, listen, he's been talking about wanting to know Jesus and his powerful resurrection and walking even in his footsteps of suffering. But he's saying, I haven't achieved it. I haven't reached perfection and neither would he this side of eternity. But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. And I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. So there are going to be three points today. And the first point is this, see the price. In order to, to have the focus, that one thing mentality that Paul had, we need to see the price, to see the goal that Paul saw. So you, you can see he starts talking in verse 12. He says, I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me, that goal. And then verse 14, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Now there's a similar passage to this, which has the kind of same phrase, phraseology and uses this term, the prize. It's, uh, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And verse 23, it follows the passage that you may know where Paul talks about doing all things so that in all possible ways he might save some people. Um, so it's in the, in the context of seeing people saved by the gospel. Verse 23, he says, I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Now, listen to how he expresses, illustrates the Christian life so that he's able to think through how he motivates himself and keeps on track of the, for the gospel. Uh, do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Do you see what he's saying? So you think about the athlete who does everything he possibly can because he wants to win. He's saying, live your life with that level of determination, but your prize is the gospel and seeing people saved. Verse 25, everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. We do it to get a crown that will last forever. In other words, he's saying, listen, think of the prize this way as well. When people actually win things in life, whether it's money or fame or whatever it is, they get something that's great, but it doesn't last forever. As believers, when we live for God, we don't earn our way to heaven. But God promised us rewards in heaven by the way we live our lives for him. And that will last forever. That's what's motivating Paul more than anybody else and anything else. 
And then he says, therefore, I don't run like someone running aimlessly. I don't meander through life. I don't waste my life. I don't fight like a boxer beat in the air. He knows exactly what he's going to do. He says, no, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will be, uh, not be disqualified for the prize. He sees very clearly what this prize is. The prize is seeing people saved. The prize is a reward that will last into eternity. The prize is knowing Christ Jesus, knowing the power of his resurrection, knowing the, the pleasure of following in his footsteps, even through suffering, being like Jesus. That's his prize. So he is so motivated to get to that prize. That's what gives him his laser focus. I was, I was watching a, an interview with George North that uh, Sam Warburton ca carried out a couple of weeks ago. And he was asking George North um, to talk a little bit about the life of a professional rugby player and to talk about what goes on really behind the scenes, I guess. So, so George then said, yeah, because what people see is just a tiny percentage of the rugby player's life. You see the time that he's on the rugby pitch, just a tiny percentage. All the other stuff is really difficult. All the training in all kinds of weathers and conditions and however you feel. Then there's the injuries and then there's the really bad injuries and the recover and then the, the ice baths or the cryo chambers. And, and then there's the mental um, difficulties of wondering whether you will come back from training, missing playing rugby, all of that stuff. All of that's behind the scenes. But he said, but you know, it's worth it for that small time, a small percentage of the time when you pull on that jersey and you get to play for Wales, and you get to go for championships and grand slams and so on. There is nothing like that. And you see, he saw the prize. The prize is pulling on the jersey and uh, the, the adulation of the crowd, the cheers of the crowd and so on. That's what motivates George North. This is what we need to be thinking of in, in a similar way. We're not going to be able to play in front of these, you know, a huge crowds kind of thing. But we need to realise that when one soul gets saved, heaven erupts as a huge celebration and millions upon millions of angels and all those who have gone before us just just then burst forth in this incredible celebration and applause and and and, and just screams of delight because one person's had their eternity changed from hell to heaven that's an incredible win for jesus christ we need to see that behind the scenes you know when you think about um people playing for Wales or, or a top team or whatever. You know, if, if someone hypothetically was, was able to say to me when I, when I was younger, Neil, if you could play for um, Wales or if you could play for Liverpool or if, if you could be a, a, a person who sees people say for the gospel, which would you choose? I would choose every single day of the week to see people being saved, a soul winner. Nothing's more important than that, is it? Can you think of anything more important than that? I know so many people talk about purpose in their lives. I, wa I wanna know what, what God's purpose is. And until I know what God's purpose is, I can't really live my life. That's, that's kind of how it goes. And they're looking for something really specific. And yes, we, we're each given different gifts, but this is our main purpose in life. This was Paul's main purpose in life. This is your main purpose in life, my main purpose in life, to see people saved to see a reward for ourselves in heaven forever and to get to know Jesus Christ and to be like him here and now. That's our purpose. And that's the biggest purpose that you can get, that anyone can get. It's the biggest thing in the whole of life. Can you see that? That's what you and I need to see. We need to see that price so that it grips us. And as Paul says, I want to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me, saved me heavenward for this prize. Secondly, we need to forget the past. This is what it says in verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead. You know, in order to properly strain towards what is ahead, we need to forget what's behind. Otherwise, we're going to be constantly looking over our shoulder and thinking about what is behind and it's going to be affecting our future. Last week, we talked about um, the problem of hurts that are, are done to us and pain and failure from the past. 
So I'm not going to talk about that this week. I'm just going to deal with this. We need to forget about our achievements of the past. In order to properly strain at what we need to be going for in the future, we need to forget our achievements even of the past. Yes, they count. Yes, they may be a great thing. But, but listen to this. Your achievements of the past do not play a factor in your relationship with God today. You see, you, you may have done some great things for God in the past. You may have got to some positions in church, ministry, leadership, and so on. You might have at times where you've been really on fire for God in the past. And to some extent, we can delude ourselves that that's who we are still now. But what counts, and only what counts, is our relationship with God now. Where are you in your relationship with God now? Let me give you an example. Um, you may have heard about a guy called Ravi Zacharias. He was, up until his death last year, one of the kind of most well-known Christian speakers in the world. He would go around the world, particularly uh, lecture theatres and in, in student um, universities and so on. Um, and he would kind of, as like an apologist, argue for the faith. And then he would take questions, and some of his answers were just brilliant answers. So he seemed to be a real kind of insightful, intelligent guy, gifted speaker. Lots of people looked up to him. And, well, towards the end of last year, um, we began to find out and confirmed now through an investigation that for years and years prior to his death and through much of his ministry, he uh, was, was in, involved in sexual misconduct, in mismanagement of, of the ministry funds, and in, in being pretty much dishonest as well it, with, with regard to some of his achievements. Now, you look at a man like that, and you just am pretty convinced that he didn't start that way. Yes, for the last part of his life, for a long time, he was so hypocritical. But pre previously in his life, he, he probably had times where he was on fire for God. He, he obviously knew the gospel really, really well. And, and you imagine that there were times where his relationship with God was good. And he was on fire for God. And he was serving God. And, and, and then he was brought into a position of real influence because of his, his giftedness. But then he started living this hypocritical life. Now, I imagine that, well, I know, I know that even right to the very end of his life, he fooled virtually everyone. Everyone thought that he was this amazing Christian, even though he was leading this awful, duplicitous life. So he fooled people. I, I reckon he was probably fooling himself to some extent as well. He would obviously have known that what he was doing was wrong. I imagine that there were many days where he hated the sight of himself and hated the sin that he was in and wanted to be free of it. I imagine that he had, he had times like that. But I also imagine he had times when he kind of looked at his life and thought, well, do you know, I'm no worse than, you know, a lot of people. And you know, a, a lot of people are saying that I'm doing really good and I'm, I'm benefiting loads of people, so God is using me, so I'm kind of like getting away with it. And he probably was fooling himself. So he's fooling people, he's fooling himself, but let me tell you who he was not fooling. He was not in any way fooling God. None of us can fool God. God can't be mocked. And so I also know for a fact that that man would have been miserable in his sin because God cannot bless a man in his, in his hypocritical sin like that. And if anybody was blessed in any way, kind of connected to his ministry, it would have been in spite of that man, not because of him and because of the grace of God. So we can fool people, we can sometimes fool ourselves, but we can't fool God. I, I just need to say this today. Listen, where are you right now? Where are you right now? And we need to do this together. We need to uh, kind of almost forget what we've done in the past in terms of when we've been on fire for God. Forget that for a minute. Forget what positions you've had in the church or what, you, what even position you have now in the church. Forget how people view you right now because all of that can be false. Let's just scrap that, scratch it all away. So it's just you now where you are in your soul, in your heart, in your relationship with God. Where are you at? 
How on fire are you for God right now? How passionate are you for God right now? How close is your relationship with God right now? How, how tough on sin are you right now? Or are you kind of really lax about it? So you've got to the point where you don't really care too much about committing sins anymore. It's a commonplace thing. Where are you in your relationship with God right now? Can you see how important it is to forget the past? If we're going to move on now, it's just ask this tough question. Where are you right now? In order for you to truly start moving forward and grasping hold of what Christ Jesus has caught hold of you for. So see the prize. Uh, <clears throat> forget the past. And thirdly and finally, gain inspiration from other people. Gain inspiration from others. This is verse 17. Paul says, join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the, gospel, of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a saviour from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly body so that they will become like his glorious body. This is Paul saying in verse 7, 17, copy me as I've been copying Jesus Christ. Look at my life. And if I'm not around, look at other people who've lived like, like me. That's what he's saying. Keep your eyes on those people who live the right way. And then he talks about other people who, he says, verse 19, their destination is destruction, their God is their stomachs, their glory is in their shame, their mind is set on earthly things. So there are, there are people who live for heavenly things. They're passionate about Jesus and they will influence you to live for him. Look towards those. Then there are other people who just live for the here and now, earthly, worldly things. They're passionate about just the physical stuff and they will influence you to just probably spend more money. We're always influenced by those people around us, aren't we? And you know, it can, be, it can be really helpful sometimes to see a Christian life lived well. You know, sometimes it's hard to really grasp when you're reading the Bible and you're trying to, trying to sort of, what does the Christian life look like? When you see it lived out, it really helps us to understand the scriptures better. Let me give you an example of what I've done in the past. In terms of trying to glean whatever you can from somebody who will help you in your Christian life. When I was at London City Mission, we used to have a, a London City Mission come in every Wednesday to teach us so that we could grow. So we were voluntary evangelists as young people. There were about 25, 30 of us living in this grotty place. And, and so the, the, this, the person would come in and talk to us in the morning and you know, that would be our kind of learning for the week. There was this guy who would come in fairly regularly because he's such a good teacher. God had really used him in his ministry amongst, um, uh, amongst the railway workers actually in London. And lots of them had been saved. But, but when he preached, he spoke well, but what really impressed me about this guy was that he spoke a real passion every time. Now, and you bear in mind that this is just a bunch of young people in a grotty place. Every time he spoke, he was moved to tears about Jesus and about the gospel. And so I listened to this guy and I think, I want to be that passionate. I want to be like that guy. And so I would go up to him after he'd spoke, uh, spoken and I talked to him about what he'd spoken about. I want to know more. And I managed to get myself an invite to his home. Creepy, I know, but I got an invite to his home. And so he invited me for a meal with, with him and his wife. I, I got the bus over to Maida Vale in London and... And we had a meal, and, but all night I just peppered him with questions. I just wanted to know everything about him and his understanding of the gospel and his understanding of Jesus because I wanted to be passionate like him. And he told me about a book. I asked him, what, tell me about a book that you've read that's made an impression on you. And he told me about this book, that, kind of like it was a book of its time. But I, I read this book then that he, that he gave me a copy of. I went away and I wanted to be as passionate as this guy. And, and at the time, we had terrible meals, terrible accommodation. <laughs> but there was one good meal a week, Sunday dinner, which I always look forward to. But I felt it was right for that time to, to go without Sunday dinner and spend the time 
just reading this book and praying. And, and so I did that, but boy, I would read two pages of the book and I would find myself not able to continue, but having to pray. And then I'd read another two pages and I couldn't continue that. And that happened week after week after week. But boy, did I meet with God and boy, did my passion grow. It was, it was such a great and an exciting time for me in my Christian life. That's what we need to do, guys. We need to glean as much as we can from people who are living for Jesus Christ and passionately doing so. But, you know, we're not limited by people who are just around us because there are just so many good things written about some of the great Christian men and women of the past that we can read. So this is my final plea today, is to read some of the great biographies that are out there. This, this week, I'm going to give you some examples. I'm going to give you some quotes uh, throughout the week about some of the great men and women of God who have really lived. And honestly, the, the way their lives were lived, they inspire you to live similar to them. That's what we need to do, guys. We need to see the prize. We need to forget the past. And we need to take inspiration from those who are living for Jesus, passionate. Because there's just one thing, guys. Like Paul said, there's one thing, one thing that's really so, so important that should grip your life that should consume my life so that everything else seems unimportant. The amazing mission of seeing people saved for Jesus Christ. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, we ask you, will you please help us to see this? Help us to see how important the gospel is. Help us to see how important seeing a soul saved for eternity is and that nothing else comes near that please we ask you in jesus name amen next we're going to sing the stand together and then we're going to listen to a testimony of a man from iraq named Ivan. Ivan left his country and all religion behind before being blown away by the words of jesus You stood before creation Eternity in your hand You spoke the earth into motion My soul now to stand You stood before Thank you. 
I was born in Iraq. I come from a mixed religious and cultural family. My dad uh, is a Arab uh, Muslim, kind of a liberal Muslim. My mom is uh, Armenian, so she is culturally Christian. Um, my dad had to flee Iraq because of the political problems with Saddam Hussein. So at the, when I was a teenager, I was sent to study on my own in Czechoslovakia. And I uh, lived there for eight years and uh, I became uh, I embraced materialistic philosophy and became an atheist and uh, a communist myself. To me, religion was basically a waste of time. Uh, I had no respect for religion because I thought it was all made up of fantasies and myths. Uh, people uh, twisted uh, things to suit their, uh, their agendas. They uh, uh, created uh, uh, systems of belief to manipulate uh, weak and and uh, disillusioned people. One day I uh, was uh, I, I got very angry and lost my temper with with the woman I loved at that time, and uh, the relationship ended. She just left me, and I just couldn't face face that loss. I just lost, couldn't deal with that, and that was amazing to me because I thought I was able to go through life. Nothing can phase me. I I can go through any problems. But the reality was that it uncovered my weakness and, uh, and uh, I realized that all this inner strength which I believed in was, was nothing, was worthless. And I suddenly realized I am to be pitied like those people I pitied before. Well, I started reading the Bible from the book of Genesis and uh, uh, later on I was starting to go to church to hear the sermon and explaining what the Bible is. And... Uh, yeah, there was the course the Christianity Explored was on, so I decided to go and uh, join the course. It was, uh, it was amazing, actually, because me being from the Middle East, we always have a suspicious mind. You know, we always think, oh, there's something not true in what people say. So uh, 
it was uh, it was funny because I tried to ask all the questions to find out if the people, the leaders on my table, will tell me the truth or they're going to try to manipulate me. Because if they tried or they tried to twist things or, you know, soften things up, so I would think, oh, it's actually, it's not so bad, you know. I discovered, no, they were just plainly explaining what the Bible is saying. And also, I just started to realize who the person of Jesus Christ really was. I had all sorts of idea about him before, but I started reading his words. I started hearing the stories he said. I started, with, you know, understanding what he did. And he blew me away. I just, I thought, this is the person I always wanted to be like in my life. I never thought there was anyone who, who, who can be like this. And uh, I was totally blown away by his integrity and the, the things he did and the things he said. It was when I went on the weekend away, which is part of the course. Um, I just came to the conclusion that I cannot keep denying the truth about Christ and who he is. And I just said, that's it, you know. I don't know what they're, what's this going to do to me, but I trust you. I'm ready to follow you, whatever and wherever you take me. And that was it. Life now has no meaning without Jesus Christ. It's, it's like a journey I am with with him, with the, with the one person who we, we were created for. I can go in walking all my life knowing that in the highs and the lows, in the sorrows and the joys, he is standing there with me and never leaving me or abandoning me. Uh, not just that, this relationship doesn't end with my death. Actually, it carries on forever. And uh, that's what I can look forward. That's what uh, life is all about. Not just now, but also forever I will enjoy that loving relationship with Jesus Christ forever. We're finishing our time together this week with the kids video and we'd just like to say thank you so much for joining us and we pray that you have a blessed and Christ-centered week. Stories of the Bible Moses and the Exodus This is Moses who was an Israelite born in Egypt in a time when Israelite boys were not supposed to live. Wait, huh? Moses, however, grew up in the palace of the Pharaoh, the very man who was enslaving the Israelite people. When Moses grew up, he made a big mistake. Uh -oh. So Moses ran away from Egypt uh -oh. to the land of Midian. Uh -oh. After many years, an angel of the Lord appeared to Moses ah! and told him to go back to Egypt to free the Israelites. After much protesting, God granted Moses his brother Aaron to speak on his behalf. Ooh. So Moses went to Egypt. Damn, and on his way there, he met Aaron who was ready to do whatever God wanted him to do. The Israelites were slaves to the Egyptians, but God had a special plan for Moses. After rallying God's people to them, Moses and Aaron went to the Pharaoh and said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, has said. Let my people go. Uh -huh. And Pharaoh made the Israelites work harder because of this. The foremen of the Israelite slaves were angry with Moses and Aaron for causing this trouble. Uh, uh. So Moses cried out to God and asked why this was happening. But God said, you will see what I will do. I am the Lord. I will deliver you from slavery. Wow, okay. Hey. Moses told this to the people. Hey, hey. But they were so discouraged that they didn't listen to him. Yeah, 
God told Moses to go to Pharaoh and to do exactly as he said. So Moses and Aaron went to the Pharaoh. Hey! God told them to take the staff and throw it down before Pharaoh. Huh? Pharaoh was not impressed. <laughs> he called his wise men and sorcerers, and they did the same thing. Ooga, ooga. <laughs> but Aaron's staff swallowed up the sorcerer's staff. Uh? Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he would not listen to them. Shoo, shoo. Just as God had said. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to the banks of the Nile River and meet Pharaoh. Hey, Pharaoh! Oh, Moses and Aaron did just as God had said. Oh. But again, Pharaoh's magicians Ooga, Ooga. did the same miracle, Ta -da. and Pharaoh refused to let God's people go. <laughs> So God sent nine more plagues to Egypt to show his power. Even with all the suffering, Pharaoh's heart stayed hard and he would not let the people go. On the night of the last plague, Pharaoh woke up Huh? and heard a great cry in Egypt. Oh, no. For there was not a house in Egypt where someone was not dead. Pharaoh summoned Moses and Aaron and told him to be gone with the Israelites. So the Israelites left Egypt immediately and made their way to the promised land, taking with them many riches from Egypt. And they took Joseph's bones as they had promised him many years before. But after they had gone, Pharaoh changed his mind and readied his army to take back the Israelites. When the Israelites saw Pharaoh and his armies come, they were terrified. But God made a way for them. Through all of this, the Israelites saw the great power of their God, the one true God, and they put their trust in Moses, his servant. Come on, come on, just eat the cookies. Ah, oh, this is pointless. Hey, Bog. Uh. Hey, friends, welcome to the Scupperton Reptile Reserve. Yeah, 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 what are you so chipper about? <laughs> well, I, I love reptiles, and I love the Reptile Reserve. I mean, I thought you did too, Bog. I did until I met this one. What are you talking about? This tortoise won't do anything I ask him to do. He won't eat the turtle cookies I made for him either. He won't drink from his water dish. I thought I'd be really good at taking care of tortoises because of Potato. Potato? My pet turtle. Oh, of course. Yeah. yeah. Potato will do anything I ask him to do, but this guy won't do anything. Everything is just wrong. I, I should just quit. Thanks for the job, Joey, but I think I should just go back to baking. Wait, wait, no, Bug, you don't just give up like that. We can we can work this out. Nah. Well, just give me a chance, Bug. Why? Well, because I think you really like working with this guy once you get a chance. I mean, he's an African spur-thighed tortoise, so he's a little bit different than your turtle. Potato. Potato, yes, he's different than potato. He's from the Southern Sahara Desert. So in the desert, it's really, really hot and dry, so they don't get their water from the rain. They actually get it from food. Oh, so... So that's why he didn't like the water bowl I made him. Exactly, so we need to maybe feed him a little bit of lettuce. I think he'll like that. Okay. Uh... Hey, that worked! Yeah, you know you can always ask for help when you feel like things are going wrong, Bog. Oh, okay, well, I'm just not used to asking for help. Well, just remember that I'm here and you can ask me whenever you need help. And you can talk to God, too. I can talk to God about a tortoise? Yeah, I mean, he cares about you. He cares about the things that you care about. So he wants to help us, especially when things are going wrong. Are you sure about that? I'm totally sure. And hey, remember the guy we're learning about in the Bible? Moses? Yeah, Moses. I mean, he had a hard time when he was trying to do what God asked him to do. But check it out, things weren't going the way he thought they would. And people he was trying to help were getting mad at him. I mean, he could have given up, but he did something else instead. 
What did he do? He talked to God, and God helped him to know what to do. Hmm. Okay, so next time everything is going wrong, and I don't know what to do, I can talk to God. Exactly, Bog. And friends, remember that when things are going wrong, you can talk to God too. He loves you, and he will always listen to you. Now, Bog, you think you can handle the tortoise now? Yeah. What do I need to do? All right, first step, we need to give this guy a name. Uh, well, that's a tough one. I, it took me a week to name Potato. Uh, hmm, how about, uh... Big potato. No, 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 that's no good. Uh, pizza. No, that's the wrong shape. Uh, um, well, uh, keep working on it, Bog. But while I get some more lettuce, we're going to see you guys next time here at the Scuppet Reptile Reserve. And remember, God loves you guys so much. And we do too. Bye, guys. <laughs>